Well, years ago, I remember reading the story in a biblical counseling book about a young man named Stephen. He was a college student, and he had been diagnosed by psychiatrists as a catatonic schizophrenic. Unable to help him on their own, his parents eventually had Stephen committed to a mental hospital where he spent most of his day sitting down, frozen in either one or two positions, barely talking, unable to engage with anyone around him. He was just gone. Then one day, Stephen was visited by a few Christian counselors who began engaging with him and asking him questions in hopes of getting him to open up. At first, the efforts seemed to be futile, but after a few weeks, they began to notice that there were some inconsistencies with his responses. It was at this point they began to suspect that there was something else going on. They pressed in with him, asking him questions, and they were encouraging him to respond so they could help him. And then one day, he broke down. He actually began to speak, and he told them what actually happened. At college, Stephen had gotten involved into the drama program, so much so, in fact, that he was notified by the school that he was failing all of his classes. He became ashamed of this, ashamed of what others might think of him, and he was also afraid to face his parents because they had paid for schooling, and he was worried about what they were going to say to him because he acted so poorly. And so rather than face the music, Stephen began to act bizarrely, and that threw everybody off. But once he realized that that worked, he began to withdraw entirely, pretending to be mentally ill, despite the fact that there was nothing wrong with him at all. To make matters worse, once he got into the hospital, everybody there treated him as though he was a victim of his circumstances, and he began to, he knew it was all an act which frightened him even more. But nothing hurt him more than the fact that his parents visited him, and when they did so, they treated him really kindly. And he knew that he didn't deserve their kindness. He had been lying to them all along. And so now he was caught. But the counselors, they began to discover all of this, and they pleaded with him to make it right. And so he had two choices. He could either go home to his parents, confess his sins, and ask for forgiveness, or he could spend the rest of his life tormented, living in the hell that the sins that he had committed had created for him. And that's the problem with sin, isn't it? Sin is destructive, and it's more destructive than we realize. Sin destroys our minds. It degrades our bodies. It defiles our consciences. It ruins our relationships. It damns us eternally. Well, how? Well, because sin is rebellion against the commands of a holy God. Or as R.C. Sproul used to say, sin is cosmic treason. And because of the heinousness of sin, God is determined to punish any and all sin to the highest degree. That is, unless it is forgiven. Because sin incurs a debt that must be paid. It can either be paid by the sinner, or it can be forgiven and released by the offended party, and in our case, that's God. But how is God able to forgive sins? Well, we know that He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay for those sins. He makes full atonement, full satisfaction for those sins, and once the debt for sin is paid, God is legally able to forgive and that brings us to the heart of the matter. What, what, what must we do to then receive God's forgiveness? After all, we can't repay the debt ourselves. We can't earn forgiveness. But how do you receive that forgiveness? We must repent. And arguably, there's no better passage of Scripture that portrays repentance more vividly than Psalm 51. And so turn in your copy of Scripture to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And I was thinking about where to go. I, I didn't want to plunge us back into Matthew before we leave for a few weeks. And so I was thinking about where to be for these two weeks. And I wanted to put a sort of a bow on the passages that we've been studying in Matthew 18. We've talked about a lot of information. We've talked about uh, confession of sin, not causing others to stumble, uh, reconciliation, con confrontation of sin, forgiveness. We've talked about so many things but I wanted to bring it to the very final conclusion because we can talk about forgiveness all day long, that we are commanded by God to forgive, but we are also commanded to repent of our sins when we do commit sin so that we can be forgiven. And so Psalm 51, it begins by containing this prescription 
that identifies both the author and the occasion for the psalm. If you look at Psalm 51 here, there's a couple of lines above verse 1 here that sort of give some direction. First line, it says, for the choir director. This was originally written by David to be sung. And then the very next words are, this is a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet had come to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This directs us initially back to the events recorded in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. This is when David was walking on the top of his roof one day, and he looked out and he spied a beautiful young woman who was bathing. Her name was Bathsheba. She was the wife of Uriah, one of his military officers. The Bible says that David saw her, he sent for her, and then he brought her in and laid with her. He commits adultery. And while he intends to cover up the the sin neatly, he soon discovers that Bathsheba is pregnant with his child. And so in a panic to cover his tracks, David then calls Uriah, the husband, home from war and tries to encourage him to go and lay with his wife in hopes of fooling him that the child that's in her belly now is actually his and not David's. Uriah, however, being an honorable man, does not take advantage of his shore leave, when, especially when all of his other fellow soldiers are at war. He does not sleep with his wife, and David is sure as caught. And so in desperation, David orders Uriah to be sent to the front lines where he will surely be killed, which he then is. David promptly, in the wake of the husband's death, marries Bathsheba, and now the child he can claim is his, and he thinks he's gotten away with this sin. But the Lord sees all. In 2 Samuel 12, we read about the Lord sending the prophet Nathan to confront David in his sin. And once he realizes he's been found out, he then repents to the Lord. And the prayer of repentance that David utters is recorded here in Psalm 51. So let's look at Psalm 51 together. Again, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice." Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will sing joyfully, will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. The first thing we note about this psalm is that it does not contain the word repentance. The Hebrew word often associated with repentance is shub, which refers to a change of action or a turning away or a turning back. And when we think about the New Testament, the most common word in the New Testament that's used for repentance is the word metanoia, which literally means to know after. But really, it's the concept of changing your mind, 
of, of agreeing in your mind with the Lord. And so repentance could be broadly defined, and Sinclair Ferguson gives us this definition. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of lifestyle. It's a godly reaction that impacts your mind and your emotions and your will. And all of this is included in, in David's psalm here. Psalm 51, just if you're taking notes, is known as a penitential psalm. There are many penitential psalms in the Psalter. Psalm 6, Psalm 32, 38, 102, 130, 143, and then certainly Psalm 51 here. And these psalms, they express great sorrow over sin, and they plead for the Lord's forgiveness. And Psalm 51 is probably, perhaps, the chiefest of them all. And to help us navigate through this psalm, and we're going to do this over two weeks, that's my plan, but I'm going to borrow the outline from Dr. Stephen Lawson, which I found to be the most helpful. And so with that, we're going to look at the first three points this morning, and we'll cover the second three next week. And so we're going to begin with number one, a cry for forgiveness. Knowing that the backstory of the psalm, we are made to aware of David's egregious sin here. And it's not just one sin. David's not apologizing to the Lord for just one sin, but really the, the many compounding sins. He, he's, he's repenting of covetousness, of lust, of adultery, and then deceitfulness, and then false witness, and then murder, and then deceitfulness again. They just keep on stacking one upon another over and over again. It's a, a horrendous compilation of wickedness done by a man who professes to love the Lord with all of his heart. Done by a man who is called a man after God's own heart. But that's how sinfulness and temptation work, right? It's always, sin always overpromises and underdelivers every time. And many otherwise righteous persons have done terrible things and then forced them, or have been forced to repent afterwards. And David is no exception. Every single sinner in the Bible commits sins and has to repent. But how can David find forgiveness? for such an awful thing. I mean, you think about the egregious nature of this sin, and many of us, I don't think we could even conceive of something like this. I mean, adultery is one thing, but then to go and actually murder the spouse in order to cover up that sin, that's just a bridge too far, isn't it? But how can David be forgiven? How can he make this right? How can he fix this? And the answer is he can't. There is nothing that King David can do to make this okay. All he can do is throw himself on the mercy of God and beg God for forgiveness. And that's exactly what he does. Look at verses 1 and 2. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. You, you hear the tone here? He's begging and pleading with God. He hasn't even gotten to any of the matters yet. He's only just prostrating himself, begging for forgiveness. And he's asking the Lord at the beginning of verse 1 to be gracious to him. Some translate, translations have rendered the Hebrew word to be uh, merciful. And now both words are similar in the Hebrew here, but they're not exactly the same. Grace has to do with God's blessing being given to a person who hasn't earned it, whereas mercy is withholding the punishment from those who actually deserve to be punished. And so if you could define it very simply, grace is unmerited favor and mercy is undeserved forbearance. So they're two sides of the same coin, and both here are meant to be pleaded with of the Lord. But David, he appeals to God's gracious character. And he also appeals to God's character by way of his loving kindness and his compassion. He knows the attributes of God. Why do we study the attributes of God? Well, because we want to know who God is so we can appeal to who he is. And that's what David does. David has a good theology proper. He understands the loving kindness and the compassion and the mercy of God. And so he asks the Lord to deal with him, but not according to his righteous wrath. We understand that God is wrathful as well, don't we? We understand that God is just, and God has anger against sin and unrighteousness. And so David is pleading with God, don't deal with me according to your righteous anger. Don't deal with me according to your divine justice. Don't deal with me any other way because you, you should. You should be dealing with me in your anger, but instead he pleads with God, deal with me graciously. Please be gracious to me. Please be merciful according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, which I know. 
God's loving kindness, that's His steadfast love that He sets upon His covenant people. His compassion is His bursting heart for His people. The reaching out in tenderness and in affection and even in pity to those on whom He sets His love. We see the same heart in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ certainly shares the same heart that God the Father does. Jesus Christ, when He looked on the crowds of people who were coming to Him, the Bible says He felt compassion for them. The Greek is splankna, of the bowels. He was pouring out his guts to the people in compassion because he recognized that they were lost and wandering like sheep without a shepherd. So the heart of Christ went out. It it spewed out of him to those who were hurting. That's the same idea here, Lord. Please extend your compassion to me. Pour out your heart to me, please, Lord. Here's the thing. David has no rights to claim. He has no rights at all. His kingship at this point means absolutely nothing. You're king of Israel? Who cares? He's simply a beggar asking God to be gracious and merciful and compassionate. What is he asking the Lord to do? In short, to grant forgiveness. But he states it in three different ways. If you look at the end of verse 1, he's asking God to blot out his transgressions. Now he's going to use three words here to describe his wickedness, and the first one is here, the word transgression. The sense of the word transgression is a rebellious act or a treasonous act against God. And he asks the Lord, all of his treason he's committed, he asks the Lord to blot out my transgressions, to wipe them away. Literally, it's to take and scrape off letters from from a book that's been written. And so we talk about the Lamb's Book of Life, what our name is being written in it. There's also the, the book that, is, that contains all of our sins. David's saying, erase, scrape out all the letters that contain notation about my sin. Please blot them out, Lord. Get rid of them. The second way he refers to his wickedness is the word iniquity. Iniquity. It refers to the idea of wandering off or growing, going astray. Isaiah 53, 6 talks about this. It's addressing us as sinners. And it says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And that's what we do when we commit iniquity. We go our own way. And so many of us today, and we see the world is going its own way, and is that going very well for them right now? No, they're destroying themselves because they will not. It used to be in in generations past, they would at least have a general vague reverence for the word of God or the command of God. And say, yes, you know, being honest is a good virtue. Being faithful to your wife is a good virtue. Uh, Not swearing and cursing in public. Taking your hat off in the building, that's not a command. But I mean, simple reverence for, for respect and honor, that's gone. They're going their own way. And that's what we do. We go our own way when we don't acknowledge and yield to the Lord. That's iniquity. And David cries out, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Just just bathe me, baptize me, wash it all away, Lord. This notion of washing goes back to the days of Old Testament sacrifice. They would oftentimes perform ritual washing and ceremonial cleansing. These washings didn't do anything physically, but rather they symbolized the spiritual cleansing from sinfulness. And this washing to remove the guilt of sin, it always comes with a renewal of relationship with God. You have your sins washed, and now you're clean, and the door has sort of been opened, and now you can see God clearly again. The relationship has been restored. And then David utters a third plea. This time he's referring to sin, specifically to sin. And what is sin? Literally, sin means to miss the mark of God's standard. It's to fail to hit his target. If God's perfect holiness is the the bullseye, it means you've totally missed the target altogether, and your arrow's in the woods. That's sin. And so David has certainly failed miserably. And he sinned, and he asked the Lord, please cleanse me. Cleanse me. This is similar to washing, but cleansing is far more complete in the sense, isn't it? It's purification. It's a purging of all the filth and defilement. David wants to be made totally clean again. So wash me, purge me, cleanse me, Lord He longs to experience the blessed joy of total forgiveness. And he tells us what that looks like. 
In Psalm 32, which we looked at several years ago as a church, but Psalm 32 is a similar, it's really part one, this is part two of his confession, if you would, but Psalm 32, he says at the very beginning of the psalm, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins have been covered, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. And so he uses those same three words, transgression, sin, and iniquity, and he said it's blessed It's a happy occasion when God forgives you of your sin. And that's what he's calling for. This is David's cry for forgiveness. But if you notice, David actually hasn't repented of anything yet. That comes in number two. Number two, the confession of sin. See, it's one thing to desire the Lord's compassion and forgiveness, but first you must humble yourself and confess the things that you know you need to be forgiven of. And so that's what he starts to do in verses 3 and 4. He says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. So verse 3, David is acknowledging his sins. Now, he doesn't list them all out here. He doesn't start by saying, well, I was deceitful and lustful and covetous, and he doesn't go all the way down the list here. But he knows what those sins are, and I can bet you dollars to donuts here that he does elucidate every single one of those sins to the Lord in his confession. He says, I know my transgressions. Some translations render this word, I acknowledge my sins, my transgressions. And so you have to know and admit your wrongdoing before you can be forgiven. Otherwise, what's to be forgiven? If you say, yeah, I'm sorry about what I did, well, what did you do? Well, you know, I I didn't do the right thing. What does that even mean, right? And that's what we do sometimes, don't we? We we say, I'm sorry about about all that. All what? I'm sorry that, that you feel hurt. What is that? It's nothing. All those things are nothing. In order to be forgiven, you have to confess the sins in specific. Because try that with God. Yeah, sorry about all that, Lord. Can you imagine? No, we we owe God honest and true repentance. Lord, I'm sorry for lying. I'm sorry for pride. I'm sorry for my deceitfulness when I said this and I should have said that. I'm sorry for my list. I'm sorry for my hard-heartedness. Whatever your specific sin is, confess it in total. And that's what David, we know David does this. And he's troubled by this. He even says, my sins are ever before me. This isn't just a generic confession. He knows he's he's sinning. They're on his mind. They're haunting him. They've been haunting him for a whole year. Again, in Psalm 32, he writes, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, he talks to the Lord, your hand was heavy upon me. I felt your hand pressing down, crushing me in my guilt and shame because I knew I owed you repentance. I felt your hand, he says, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Then he says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. True confession means you come clean. You name your sin and you seek to have it forgiven. Otherwise, it will eat you alive. And so many times, and I fear this for the body of Christ, I really do, that when you go around, you just lumber through life with sins hanging over your back, and you don't confess them, you don't deal with them. You don't confess to the Lord, you don't confess to other people. It just weighs you down, and it eats you alive, and it burrs a hole right through your soul, and it defiles your conscience, it makes you sick to your stomach, it makes you miserable. Unconfessed sin is one of the worst things you can have to deal with. Physical pain, I'll take physical pain all day long, but the the aching and the burning in my conscience over a sin that has not been confessed, that's a pain you don't want. And here's the thing, you don't have to carry it. Your physical pain might be with you forever, or at least in this life, but but the, the pain and the anguish over unconfessed sin, you can confess, beloved. You can tell the Lord your sins. You can go to your brother or sister you've sinned against, and you can seek forgiveness. And we've already seen the last 10 weeks that we are called and commanded to forgive, aren't we? 
And so not only does David here admit his sins, he doesn't seek to make excuses or to justify himself. Look at verse four. Against you, he's talking to God, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. David here, he's not saying that he's innocent of sins against other people. He's not saying, I've only sinned against you, God. I'm not going to worry about anybody else. That's not what he's doing. Because obviously, he had sinned against Uriah. He'd sinned against Bathsheba, Uriah's family, his own family, his own wife. And because of his position as king, David has essentially sinned against all of Israel. And he's actually, at the end of the psalm, in verses 18 and 19, he's going to pray that God would restore worship in Israel because it had been hindered because of his sin. And so he's not denying any of the the effects, the consequences of his sin on other people. Rather, he's affirming that God is the ultimate offended party. I can sin against my brother and sister, and that's one thing, but if I don't acknowledge that I've sinned against God, I'm totally missing the mark. And so that's what's going on here. David acknowledges, God, I've sinned against you first. And I need to get right with you before I do anything else. He knows that. His sin was supremely against the law of God. And here's the thing. He knows, he calls it what it is. He's keenly aware that this is evil. He says, I've done what is evil in your sight. He doesn't make excuses even for that. He doesn't downplay his sin. He doesn't call it, oh, just, you know, my picadillos, my character flaws, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to minimize your sin with, having a bad day. That's not what he does. He says, Lord, I've done evil in your sight, and I've got to deal with that. And so we as believers, we can't downplay our sins. Call it what it is. Purge your heart. I've done evil. I've thought evil things. I've said evil things, and by my own shame, I've done evil things. Call it what it is, because if you don't deal with it as as it is, you'll never experience the blessing of full forgiveness. And so David is not denying any of that. He's willing to accept his consequences. He's not making excuses. And so therefore, in the light of not making excuses, look at what he says. Lord, you are justified when you speak. When you convict me, I accept it. You're justified. You're righteous, God. I'm not. And he says, and you're blameless when you judge. So he's saying, essentially, whatever God decrees, it's good, right, and true. Lord, whatever you decree as my punishment, I will accept it. You are righteous, you're blameless in how you judge. Here's the thing. God could choose to kill David along with his entire family, just like he did with Achan in Joshua chapter 7. If God did that, he could be completely justified. He could kill David. He should kill David for what he's done. An eye for an eye, right? He killed Uriah. David should die as well. And so David is not dodging his responsibility. True repentance accepts the consequences for sin and makes no excuses. There should be no footnote in your repentance. I did this and this and this, but it's because I'm not feeling very good today. If you sin, you sin. Now, there may be factors that are bringing this about. That's fine. We accept that. We're human. But if you commit transgression, own up to it. Call it what it is. And that's what David's doing here. True repentance accepts the consequences. And so David knows that he alone is the sinful party. But he even goes a step further. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, David is not blame-shifting to his mother for why he's so awful. We do that today. That's a tactic that many people will do. Well, I'm the way I am because of the way my parents raised me or because of some sin in my father or my mother. It's very easy to blame your parents, but that's not what David's doing at all, actually. Rather, he's speaking theologically of what we know to be the doctrine of total depravity. Total depravity, what is that? See, it's not just that David has committed sins in his lifetime. He is born with a sin nature. He's born with it. This is the way he came out of his mother's womb. Even at conception and birth, he'd already inherited Adam's sin nature. It's just like what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, 18. He says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the wishing of, is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So David is not saying, I'm really a good person, I just do bad things. 
That's not what he's saying. No, what David is saying here is I was born in sin. In sin, my mother conceived me. I'm a sinner by nature. I was born a sinner. I will die a sinner, but I need to be forgiven. It's the acknowledgement of the sin nature. And that's what there's a, I'm not going to get into the whole theological treatise here, but there's the, the, this concept of Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism. If you research that, you'll see what it is. But this idea that somehow we're not born with a nature that is completely sinful. Or that somehow there's some kind of prevenient grace that can jump in and like sidestep that sin nature. But the bottom line is that Scripture is abundantly clear. We're born with sin nature. It's in us, and there's nothing that we can do to remove that from ourselves. The only removal, the only forgiveness is the grace of God poured out onto us. It's sovereign. It's completely of God. And so David is pleading for this. He's pleading for forgiveness. Verse 6. Behold, this is back to the Lord, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Bible scholars see a connection here between verse 5 and verse 6. And if you notice the connection, the word behold begins verse 5, behold in verse 6. Now that could just be a coincidence, right? But I don't think so. Because here's what's going on. In verse 5, David is declaring that even at birth, he was created sinfully. He came out of his his mother's womb sinfully. Therefore, there's nothing in his innermost being that is good. He's both the victim of it and the perpetrator of the fall. You see that? He's both the recipient of the curse of the fall and the perpetrator of that curse as well. Charles Hodge used to say, we are sinners by nature and by choice. It's both. However, verse 6, he maintains that God's desire was not for humanity to, humanity to be sinful. He declares, Behold, God, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me no wisdom. So we see a juxtaposition here between what God commands and what God desires and what is. See, it's not simply enough to say that you're sorry and act repentant. Your heart must be humbled and changed. See, God desires truth. Other translations render this loyalty integrity in the heart, in the innermost being. You can't, you can, maybe you can fool other people with your repentance, but you can't fool God. He knows if you're genuinely sorry over your sin. And so God desires earnestness and loyalty and truth in the innermost being. David is confident that in his own repentance, God will, in the, in the inner part, the hidden part of his own heart, that God is going to teach him the truth, right from wrong, by the Holy Spirit, Because after all, that's God's promise in the new covenant. That he will put his law within them, within their hearts. He will write it on their hearts. That's Jeremiah 31. Now, we know that David is not living in light of the new covenant yet. But the truth, the general truth, the principle of this is still the same. That God desires to write truth on our hearts. That's what Romans 2 says. Romans 2 says that that we know the law of God written on the human heart, on the inner man. Our conscience bears witness to all this. And so God is desiring to teach us truth, to instruct us in our repentance. And that's what the Spirit of God does. He uses his word, but he brings the word to life in your conscience. And so as believers, we know right from wrong. We feel the sting of our sin, and then we know. We, we read the Bible, you read Psalm 51. If you're, and by the way, if you're ever caught in sin, you don't really know what to do, you don't know how to pray, you're just stuck, just read Psalm 51. I'm serious. Read Psalm 32, read Psalm 51, and just meditate and pray through every single line of this psalm, and you will find, if the Spirit is working in you, that you will feel the conviction and you'll begin to pour out repentance to God. That's why the psalms are written, to instruct us and to give us language for our repentance, for our worship, for our sorrow, for our joy. These are, so, these are heart, heart words given to us by the Lord. And so that's the desire. God is going to teach us what to do, how to repent, what to believe about our sin. And so that's what he's saying here, that God will instruct him and make him to know wisdom. But again, all of this, acknowledging sins, repentance, admission of guilt, desiring righteousness, it's all part of David's confession of his own sin. And then we see in number three, a call for cleansing. 
a call for cleansing. Picking it back up in verse 7 here. David, he continues to express his desire for forgiveness and spiritual cleansing. He says in verse 7, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Remember that David has already asked the Lord to wash and cleanse him, verse 2, right? He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. He repeats these sentiments over and over again. It's almost as if he doesn't really know what else to say. He's just begging God, cleanse me, wash me, purge me, purify me, Lord. But this word purify, the English Standard Version and the New King James actually render this purge me. And that's true as well. But purify, he says, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. What is this referring to? The language refers back to the Levitical law in the Old Testament, specifically to the law that deals with with cleansing lepers, actually, because leprosy was a serious skin condition that if untreated would be so bad it would eventually rot away the body from the outside in. This condition was so dangerous to society where lepers were actually quarantined and, and kicked out of the camp. They had to live on the fringes outside of society until they could either be healed or they would die out there. And so The leper, if they were cleansed, if they were healed, they would come back and they would present themselves to the priest. And Leviticus 14 expounds and elaborates on the ritual that was to be performed if they were healed of their leprosy. They could make an offering to the Lord. They would sacrifice uh, ceremonially and they would be ceremonially cleansed uh, of that illness. And so Leviticus 14.6 14.6 describes the ritual that involves uh, taking a, a, a bird and killing the bird, sacrificing the bird, and pouring out its blood. And then you take a, a bird that's alive, and you begin to dip it in the blood of the bird that's been slain. And along with that bird, you actually attach to the bird cedar wood, a scarlet str- thread or string, and then a hyssop branch. And so when David is talking about being purified with hyssop, he's making reference to this purification ritual, this cleansing of the lepers. And in doing so, what he's saying is, I don't have physical leprosy, but I have spiritual leprosy. And in connecting those dots, he's picturing himself essentially as the live bird that's being cleansed in the blood of the dead bird that's been slain for him. Does that sound like anything else we know? Being cleansed in the blood of someone who's been slain for you? There's some layers, there's some, I think there's some imagery here. But nonetheless, this is what David's talking about. He's asking God to purify him, to purge him of his iniquity, to cleanse him, to wash him. And he says, if you do that, Lord, I will be whiter than snow. How white is snow? There's not much else that's whiter than snow, right? He says, but I'll be cleansed whiter, purer than even the whitest snow. And that's the Lord's promise to Israel in the years to come. Isaiah 1.18 The Lord tells sinful Israel, though your sins are scarlet, they're blood red, they'll be as white as snow. Red like crimson, they will be like wool. The idea here is complete and total cleansing. Ever try to get grape juice out of a white garment? It's near impossible, isn't it? I'm sure someone has an OxyClean, they can probably do it and yada, yada, yada. But the point is, is you try to get that kind of a stain or even blood out of a garment, They dig up old garments that are in graveyards with blood still on them. They can't even get it out. It's it's not possible. So David is talking about being purged and cleansed and clean of all of these impurities, all of the scarlet, all of the blood of his iniquity, being white as snow. Verse 8, David further desires not only forgiveness and cleansing, but he also is desiring the healing that comes with it. Verse 8, he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. David knows that once he's forgiven, all the guilt that he's been carrying for the last 12 months will be lifted off of him, and the misery he's experiencing will be gone. And David oftentimes will talk about the physical effects of his sin on his body. Psalm 6, 6. He says, I am weary with my sighing. My eye is wasting away with grief. Psalm 32, 3, my body wasting away through my groaning all the day. David talking here about his bones feeling like they've been broken by the Lord. 
he's hobbling around with this guilt and this shame over sin, and it feels like he's toting a, a broken leg or a broken rib. It's so painful to him. It just feels like his body's falling apart. Carrying the weight of sin, it feels like God is crushing his bones and breaking him down, and yet he longs for joy and gladness and for his, medical, his metaphorical bones to be healed so that now his bones, his bones can even rejoice in the Lord. But it can only happen if he's been forgiven. And so once again, verse 9, he reiterates, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. At this point, it's clear David's not asking for God to hide his face in terms of avoidance. He's not saying, oh Lord, just look the other way. That's not what he's saying. Rather, he's asking God to blot out, to scrape out all the record of his iniquities and don't look at them anymore. Just, just scrape, scrape it off your book, Lord. Put your book aside. Don't look at it and just see the righteousness that you've given to me. I'm too ashamed to look at my own sins and I don't want you to look at them either, Lord. Forgive me so that you don't have to. My friends, that's real repentance. David is modeling for every other sinner in history what this ought to look like. And I think even in Psalm 51, I think the reason Psalm 51 is so powerful is because this sin is so egregious. And a person reading this might say, yeah, but I've done things that are really, really bad. I've done things that I can't even talk about in public. I've done things I can't even talk to a counselor about. We all have those kinds of, I've thought things that I just can't even utter. And we think about the egregious nature of our own sin, and you look at Psalm 51 and say, if David can lust and commit adultery and then lie and murder and cover it up, and he can be forgiven, then maybe there's hope for me too. And the Bible testifies there is, that God will forgive your sins. And you might be thinking, I, I've dug such a hole for myself, I don't even know which way's out. I can't, I, I'm so far down in my sins. I've got sins that are piled up upon sins, I, I just can't even see the light of day. So what do I do? I don't even remember all of my sins. Or maybe you're stuck in a situation where it's gone on so long, you don't even remember how it started. Begin here. You go to the Lord and you drop your head. And you quiet your heart. And you banish all excuses. And you humble yourself down. And you pray to the Lord. Be gracious to me, O oh God. According to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion. Lord, blot out my transgression. Cleanse me, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me of my sin, Lord. And be honest with him. Just tell him. I don't even know where to start, God. And if you have the heart that is repentant, that is humble, that is prostrate before God, beloved, I promise you, the Spirit of God working in you, He will begin to unearth your sins and bring them to your face, and you will say, I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. He will make you to know your sins, and if you confess and repent, He will make you to know righteousness and wisdom too. He'll help you to work through it, because beloved, God desires that you be forgiven. That's why He sent Jesus. That's why we have good news. God desires that we repent and experience forgiveness. And so he's not going to dangle the carrot of salvation in front of you, then snatch it away and say, well, good luck. That's not our God. Because all of this is according to his loving kindness and his compassion and his mercy and his love. And so if you're struggling, if you have sins that you've never dealt with or things that are hanging over your head, be encouraged. Be encouraged. God will hear you. God will respond to you. Just don't hide from Him. Don't pretend like everything is just fine if it's not. Go to the Lord. And David, again, he keeps on going here. We haven't even gotten to part two. Part two is next week. But again, what do you do if you need to be forgiven? You go to the Lord and maybe, maybe you're here today and you say, 
you know what, I don't even know what this even looks like. I've never been forgiven of my sins. I've never trusted in Jesus Christ. This is the first time I've even been here to this church today. I don't even know what's going on here. Well, the bottom line is this. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have transgressed his law, either by deed or by word or by heart. We've said things, we've thought things, we've done things that are evil in God's sight and even evil against other people. But our sins are paid for by Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth and he lived perfectly. He never sinned. Then he took his life of perfect righteousness and he offered it on the cross and he died as a penalty, as a sacrifice, as an atonement, a payment for sin. And he offered up his perfect life to all who would receive. You trust in me, you confess your sins to God and I will grant you the effects of my perfect life. We call this imputation where God then removes the guilt and shame and punishment of our transgressions, and he lays them onto Christ. And then he imputes or credits the righteous life of Jesus and places it onto us. And so when we stand before God, we don't stand before him as sinners. We stand before him as those who've been forgiven. And God accepts us into his arms and says, yes, I know you've sinned, but yet my son has paid for those sins. And so I will choose to remember them no more. And that's what God does. He chooses to remember our sins no more as long as they've been paid for by Christ. Beloved, be encouraged. If you have the burden of sin on you, quiet your heart, and we're gonna enter into this time of communion in a moment here, but do this now before we even get to the table. As we pray, just drop your heart, drop your eyes and confess Lord, this has been a rotten week. I've sinned against you over and over. Or maybe it's been a month or six months or a year. Maybe your whole lifetime. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me by the blood of Christ. And I know I'll be forgiven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, none of us in this room are perfect. None of us are righteous inherently. All of us have turned aside, away from you. We've gone aside and done what we think is right in our own eyes. We've gone astray. And yet you offer us a sacrifice for sin, a propitiation, an atoning sacrifice, one who stands in our place and satisfies the wrath that is meant for us. And we know that that propitiatory sacrifice, the one who paid for us, that is none other than Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself gave his own life on the cross for us. And well, all we have to do, not to simplify, O oh Lord, but all we have to do is come to you, as David will later say, with a broken and contrite heart, with a spirit that is broken and just says, Lord, have mercy on me. Hear my confession of all my sins and by your loving kindness, by your compassion, blot out my transgression. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from my iniquities, O Lord. Purge me of all my evil. And by your grace, O God, your wonderful and abundant and amazing grace, you do. And that's who we are as Christians, Lord. We are those who've been forgiven and had our sins removed. And so, Lord, I pray, if there's any here who need forgiveness, If there's any here who needs to confess, Lord, don't stop pressing in on them until you can grant them their repentance, O Lord. Please don't allow any of your sheep to leave here this morning with sins and burdens still on their back. Lord, I plead as an under-shepherd of Christ to remove the guilt and the shame from your people, O Lord. I intercede in the lowest possible form, subservient to Christ who is the intercessor. I plead as the pastor of this church. Convict where you must convict. Bring about repentance where you must bring repentance. And forgive the iniquity 
of all your sheep here, that they might experience the, the joy and the blessing, that their bones might be healed, that they would leave this morning walking and leaping and praising God. Don't stop working, O oh Lord, until you are satisfied. And I plead all of this on behalf of our sufficient Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray all of this in His name. Amen.